education of the Gambia. She joined UNESCO in 2004 as director of basic education based in Paris. She then headed up UNESCO's West Africa office before becoming regional director of the UNESCO regional office for Eastern Africa, which is her current position. Thank you for traveling from Nairobi to be with us. Our next panelist is Dr. Rocio Diaz Chavez. Dr. Diaz Chavez is the Deputy Director of the Stockholm Environment Institute and, like Anne, Therese, and myself, is based in Nairobi. She has done extensive work in sustainability assessments. She received the Scope 2010 Young Scientist Award in Environmental Management for her work on indicators and standards. Please welcome her once again. Our next panelist is Hans Bolscher. Is he in the room or will he be joining us shortly? He's right here with us. Hans is a consultant on renewable energy and innovation. He previously served as director of climate and industry at the Dutch Ministry of Environment. And at the Ministry of Economic Affairs, he was director of carbon <laughs> capture and storage. Mr. Bolscher began his career in Africa in the 1980s when he worked for MSF or Médecins Sans Frontières. And finally, we are honored to have a 2008 Next Einstein Forum Fellow with us in the person of Dr. Justice Massa. He is based at the Center for Electrochemical S Sciences at Ruhr University Bochum in Germany. He also serves as advisor to the govern government of Uganda on adding value to minerals as part of the Presidential Investors Roundtable Initiative. He holds a PhD in chemistry, and before going to Germany, he studied at Makerere University in Uganda and worked as a visiting scholar at Oxford University. Welcome. As for your moderator, my name is Catherine Touré, and I am with Canada's <laughs> International Development Research Center, or IDRC. I serve as the regional director of IDRC in the Office for Sub-Saharan Africa. And it is my pleasure to moderate today's panel on behalf of IDRC President Jean Lebel. Jean is a big supporter of the next Einstein Forum, and he participated in the 2016 NEF in Dakar. He asked me to thank the NEF leadership, leadership and the government of Rwanda for organizing this year's forum, which thus far has been so successful. I was gonna say a little bit about IDRC, but I think we should pass right on to the topic at hand. But before we turn to the panelists today, maybe just a word about circular economies. Circular economies are just that. They're circular in nature. They're not linear. So imagine a world in which we reduce, reuse, recycle, remanufacture, repair, and continually renew. Different industries and production systems are linked. Waste from one process becomes an input into, the, into another process. We make the best use of resources, they do not find their way so easily into dumps, which produce almost 10% of global greenhouse emissions. Our production and consumption patterns mirror more natural and biological processes, just as our NEF fellow was explaining. And so with that brief introduction to the concept of circular economies, we're going to turn to our esteemed panelists to begin the discussion. We'll hear from ask each of them a couple of questions before going to the group and then back to the panelists. So, Mr. Minister Biruta, if we might begin with you. What is Rwanda's outlook on the circular economy? Thank you for the question. Rwanda is uh, very positive uh, about pr the prospects of a circular economy not only to address environmental issues, but also to foster economic growth and uh, job creation. 
as a concept, we might say that uh, it's a circular economy is a new concept in Rwanda and in Africa, but in practice, circular economy has always been there. In Rwanda and in Africa, we used to extend life of many uh, tools by repairing, by maintaining, even uh, starting with clothes, shoes. We use not just to dispose of them, but to repair, to maintain them so that you extend their life. In Africa, in Rwanda, we use to share some tools like axes or other domestic tools. <coughs> and those are examples of a secret economy practice. Even if it is not defined as a, as a concept in our daily life, but the practice is there. Today in Rwanda, we have uh, some businesses which are based on the secret economy principle. There are businesses here who, which are renting ceremonial clothes. And this is an example of uh, circular economy. We don't buy just a suit you are going to put one day in your life, but you can hire it for that day. We used to have uh, initiatives where people share transport just to take schools, to, to take kids to schools. People organize themselves to, to share car, their cars. So those are examples to show that the practice has been there in the past. It, it is there today, even if we don't refer to it as a secret economy, to, as a secret economy as a concept. But in Rwanda, we, we look forward to benefiting from that concept, and we just need to adopt the um, policy, to adopt it in our policies. We are reviewing our environmental law today, and we are going to make sure we have a chapter on the circular economy. The other thing we need to do is to bring on board all the stakeholders, government, private sector, uh, and industries to make sure it becomes, circular economy becomes a principle of production. That's a great uh, introduction to the concept with specific examples and a reference to some of the governance mechanisms that need to be in place. So we'll come back with a few more questions momentarily. Um, Anna Therese, over 600 million people in Africa do not have access to reliable energy. Do you see this as an opportunity or a threat when it comes to the concept of circular economy? Okay, thank you very much, um, Catherine. Um, it depends on um, how you look at it. Is it half full or half empty? And I, I want to start um, looking at it more positively. Um, yes, we have 600 million. Do we despair or do we look at what we have? And one thing we have in Sub-Saharan Africa um, is uh, the sunlight, bringing nature closer uh, to human beings. And here, I want to say, in Africa, we don't have energy. Do we really ape what other countries have done to generate energy? Or do we go to what we already have? In general, there had been um, you know, use of hydroelectrical power. That's good. But then you have the sunlight. Can we use solar? Here, we're talking about circular air economy. And um, it's another buzzword. It's about sustainability. It won't be sustainable for us uh, to ape the Western countries, but use what we have. The solar energy could help us to ensure we can, through innovation and a change of attitude, benefit. I think one of the, the, the laureates mentioned it. Solar energy would ensure that we can light all our cities, our villages. We can, through solar energy, increase production. Let me bring it closer home to agriculture. Again, that is using um, you know, smart climate innovative approaches. Rather than uh, generate um, the water <coughs> pump using petrol, we can really use solar pumps. And we will provide water in abundance for the farmers to be able to increase their produce. 
And in Africa in general, there's been the leaning towards, you know, gas and oil, they said in the northern part, there's more of that. Um, in the southern part, um, we, we tend to, to really have a different uh, um, access. But in general, you have what it takes in sub-Saharan Africa you, using biomass. But we, there is a limit to all of this, and the best thing would be to go by um, solar energy um, and uh, generate the kind of um, uh, production that would reduce um, poverty. It could increase health services, uh, because in most of our clinics, we cannot access energy. So I just want to use energy as a means of production by using solar energy as opposed to um, other forms of energy. That's an excellent segue into this whole question of biomass and how biomass might be related to circular economies. Do you have thoughts on that, Rocio? Thank you, Catherine. Yes, actually, we have to remember that uh, the, the three main principles of the circular economy are uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle, at least these three steps. Uh, and in that sense, the role of bioeconomy, and actually we had also from one of the laureates a presentation on, on biotechnology, this is improving the way that we use the biomass. So we can be using the residues, for example, and this gives us a possibility of having uh, better forms, creating new value chains, that can contribute to the circular economy in different parts uh, uh, here in, in Africa. For instance, uh, the relation with, uh, with uh, or the difference, if you want to say, with bioenergy, is that bioenergy is kind of um, an, a co-product within the bioeconomy. So you can get more things from the, or more products from different alternative feedstocks that could be this type of residues could be agricultural residues, forestry residues, or even waste, municipal uh, solid waste that could be used for this kind of new products. I think that uh, we have seen some examples on how they start. Uh, a typical one would be with uh, um, the production of pellets, for example, from agricultural residues, like it is done now in, in Kenya with the residues of pineapple. So they, they have been producing pellets. Uh, there are other, um, uh, actually I found out that here in Rwanda, there is, a, there is an organization that is producing pellets from the residues of the sawmills. So they have sawmills for eucalyptus and they use the residues to create pellets. And of course these are basic products, but it is possible to try to think of a next level on how to improve and create new products within this base of bioeconomy and have different uses for them. Thank you. So Hans, talking about getting to this next level, in your opinion, how do we get to that next level that Rocio is talking about? How do we get to that next level? <coughs> um, we will need two things. We need companies who like to do this, and we need governments who make it possible. At this moment, uh, although there is enormous potential and technical possibility, it's not happening very often. Because it's not so profitable. Putting your waste in the, uh, in the dump and extracting uh, all kind of minerals from the earth is very cheap. And as long as that is very cheap, then a, and a circular alternative is more expensive, then it will not happen at a large scale. So we have to do something to change the economics of circular economy. And it's relatively simple. It is about making extraction way more expensive, making waste way more expensive, and then automatically the alternatives will become in the money. They will become an interesting business case where companies will be interested to move into. Of course, there's companies now taking some interest in the subject and there are some nice examples and that will remain if we don't change the fundamentals below the f two three four percent level because you can't as a company you have to be oriented at profit that's your natural orientation and that's good 
but it's up to the governments to create a, a level playing field wherein the abuse of Mother Earth by extracting at randomly and the abuse of Mother Earth by throwing away all our garbage without, at, at zero cost, that that becomes no longer possible. Then circular economy has a, a serious chance. Thank you so much. It's important to talk about these governance issues and the incentives that will get us to a circular economy, but I know that justice prefers to talk about technological issues rather than the governance issues. So, in relation to circular economies, what are the most promising technologies that could be adopted on the continent, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, there's one great one, actually, which my sister there already mentioned, and this is the solar. Now, allow me to give the example of Germany because it makes an excellent case. Uh, Germany has installed solar capacity of up to 40,000 megawatts. 40,000 megawatts. Uh, in Africa here, we have enormous solar. Germany has it maybe four months in a year. Now, if there's an industry called ambition, we have to question our ambition. We have a resource that we are not using, which can unlock a lot. When, we, when you put 40,000 megawatts of electricity on the grid city in Africa, this causes enormous change. Now, in line with that, of course, we don't stop at looking at solar. It has a supply chain. Where does the supply chain begin and where does it end? The supply ch chain of solar begins with sand. So you take silicon from your sand uh, to make photovoltaic panels. And then you need some other elements. So one of the questions is I think Africa has to get ambitious to try to look at can we create a silicon valley here, a different silicon valley, where we use our sand to create our silicon and dop this silicon with elements to create our solar panels here. This is enormous. Now leaving that, aside, it comes a little bit to my line of research, because in photovoltaics, when you generate the electricity, you need to store it. So then there's the next item here is storage. So we're speaking about batteries. And uh, in the talk that I just gave, I mentioned about the hydrogen economy. And when we speak about the hydrogen e economy, for me, this is the ultimate dream of a circular economy because you produce hydrogen from the sea, generate electricity, pump it, keep cycling it around. Any other element, as I mentioned, lithium is very exciting at the moment. And for me, it's exciting because we don't understand. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's uh, how much reserves do we have, especially here in Africa, we have no lithium except Zimbabwe. And statistics show that uh, by 2040, we shall have nearly used up all the lithium if we go full-scale electromobility. So Africa, in this case, when I talk about the hydrogen economy, I think we can take an ambitious step and say, can we be leaders in this technology? And, not, and this is where we talk about Africa charting its own way. So we can chart a green path, and this is a sustainable path which we can stay on for a long time. So this is one big one. And of course, this unlocks so many other sectors. I, I will not go into the specific cases, but in terms of thinking circular, maybe I want to remind the whole ed audience that maybe there are many circular industries. Let me talk about ammonia, the ammonia industry. Now, all of us would probably not be here today if we did not <coughs> master the art that nature is circular. Now, prior to the Industrial Re Revolution, there was a starvation in Europe. Agricultural productivity was going low because the plants were extracting nutrients from the soils than nature could replenish these nutrients. So there was risk of starvation, and that's when the ammonia industry was invented to help bacteria to fix nitrogen into the soil. Because if the soil does not eat, we do not eat. And the ammonia industry is huge. We don't have it here in Africa. So it's an example of another circular industry which we need for our own uh, sustainability. 
I could give many examples, but maybe in, in short, yeah. I would yeah, stick we'll, on we'll this come one. back. Thanks for your aspirational uh, perspectives and the technical perspectives. Maybe we're going to back off the technology for a moment and come back this way with Hans. You were talking to me earlier about uh, across the fence collaboration between different industries where you have waste from one recirculating into another and having more of a systemic approach. Could you talk a little bit more about that or how do you see, in, how do we create incentives for that? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said before, I mean, uh, if the business of business is, is their profit, and of course they also are happy to look around, but it doesn't happen automatically. It's not that business is not interested in environment or that business is not interested in, in the future of the planet. Of course they are. But they are focusing on their own premises very often. And what can be very helpful is to break through the fences. Because very often what is a waste for one industry is a very, can be a valuable input for the next industry. And governments can help to link these chains where industry is concentrating on their own because that's where their uh, focus is. Government can bring in a region partners together and ask, what can we do together? Is there other interesting streams that we can bring together? And then quite often you will see very surprisingly combinations of industry that, uh, that can work together. So also here, government can play a role in opening up to see where uh, the, the, the circle can be closed. Having said that, if you only do this and you don't do what I said before, making it profitable, making it interesting business, uh, then the talks will remain nice talks and that will not be effective. You have to give something to the companies and to the industry to make it profitable. The Honorable Minister gave a very nice example on renting the ceremonial dresses. I presume that it's cheaper to rent than to buy. And that makes it interesting. If, if not for that, then probably people would prefer to buy. So there's always this element of uh, economics in the background. And what about assessing, assessments? You're an expert, Rocio, in uh, assessment methods. So can standards and assessment have a role to play in promoting circular economies? I think um, there are some environmental management tools that have been, uh, they're very well established, they have been uh, uh, in use for more than 30, 40 years. So there is a way to, to use them. Um, but one of the things that I have found is that, particularly in Africa, in several countries, these tools are really not used. And these are uh, simple tools, let's say, like environmental impact assessment, social impact assessment, a strategic environmental assessment, but one that is particularly important for uh, the circular economy is the life cycle assessment with all the varieties that it has. And this is something that from the research point of view, we still need to do more for these new um, value chains that are coming out of them, like Hans was saying, on, in terms of the industry and you can create blocks and how they are applied. And with the knowledge, let's say, on the use of certain indicators from the point of view of sustainability, then you can also uh, uh, look not just at the environmental part, but also the social part of what these new uh, value chains within the circular economy are bringing. And these include, of course, socioeconomic issues uh, uh, such as job creation, but also which type of jobs we are looking at uh, jobs that are, uh, are better of what we currently have with some of these uh, uh, raw examples of circular economy like the recycle for in landfills so that these jobs can be somehow formalized. What is the role of women in terms of these kind of new value chains? And also how we can really uh, come out not just from this, uh, if you want to say, technical side, but we have to also consider processes, frameworks, and even the policies and standards, how we can regulate this circular economy and to, to have the best of, of, of it, and how we can really enforce certain, certain aspects of it. 
Thank you so much, and I'm glad in responding that you brought up um, research and the social side of social uh, circular economies. So, Anne Therese, could you speak uh, about the role of science and maybe the role of UNESCO in contributing to the development of circular economies in Africa? <coughs> Thank you very much. I think um, UNESCO, we are working uh, from uh, two uh, fronts. Um, there is an the issue of uh, linking it also to climate change. And there has been a declaration um, signed somewhere in um, November 2017 uh, that is really looking at certain ethical principles and challenging member states to really um, uh, reflect more on how in the process of um, uh, waste reduction, waste management, they would pay close attention to certain ethical uh, principles. Um, and uh, I just want to really go a little bit to talk about um, another aspect which is linked to policies. What type of policies are in place um, to really ensure that um, we benefit from this uh, circular economy? And uh, principally, I give an example, and these are practical ones, use cars. You know, there are certain governments uh, that have policies uh, on the age of the car before it comes into the country. Um, whilst that is good, we still are contributing to some element of pollution. But once the cars come in, there is no regulation and they can stay on and on and on. So that is adding to pollution in the country. Um, the other issue that we also have to look at is um, uh, some of the trade agreements um, whereby we have multinationals and, and corporations that would come into the country to do business. Um, I, I come from the Gambia and um, we have a case in point where we have a fish, uh, fishing company um, that is uh, working on um, processing fish and fish oil. But in the process, the waste um, from this factory had not been factored into the agreement and it's adding pollution. Um, you have industrial waste. So th there are certain ethical principles that should guide how we really engage both in terms of business, in creating employment, but also in protection of the environment. Uh, another area of uh, work that UNESCO is uh, really focused upon is on water, both um, uh, surface water and underground water. And uh, we have um, what we call the International Hydrological um, Program, which does a lot of research on water sources. And uh, take for instance, in Africa, we do have situations of drought. And, but really, when, when, when studies are undertaken, it has shown that we do have um, huge underground reserves. Um, for instance, in Kenya, in Turkuna we, in Turkuna, we have the biggest underground lake. What are we doing about it? And so therefore, when I talk about um, what UNESCO does is we, we, we accompany uh, member states to do studies, but one thing that is lacking is the research. What, uh, in, for instance, let's take water. How much research can we manage? And therefore, it links to education and our universities. Do we do research in really benefiting from uh, this circular economy? It's not just about the money, but it's also about the health and uh, the well-being of the individuals. Now, coming from a research organization, I would like to see more research done on circular economies in Africa. Min um, Minister Biruta, would you be able to tell us about uh, the agreement on circular economies that has been signed by, or that was agreed upon at COP23 uh, and what this might mean for taking us forward on circular economies and anything else you'd like to add before we go to the floor? Yes, it was uh, not an agreement actually. It was, uh, we launched along with Nigeria and South Africa what we call the, the African Circular Economy Alliance in collaboration with uh, the World Economic Forum and uh, the UN Environment Program. And uh, the idea is uh, to spur Africa's transformation to a circular economy which delivers economic growth, jobs, jobs creation, and positive environment out environmental outcomes. That alliance will help us to share experience and uh, lesson learned so that we can fast track the adoption of circular economy across the continent. We have uh, our own experience here in Rwanda. South Africa has their own experience. But if we need to adopt it 
at the continental level, we need to work together and to learn, to learn from uh, the best practices here and there and to learn how we can bring these principles in our policies. Uh, <coughs> my colleagues here have talked about uh, industries working together. Actually, even if here we have very good examples of circular economy in our businesses, in our industries, what we need to do is to be able to have an industrial symbiosis so that an industry which is producing waste, that waste can serve as a raw material input for another industry. industry. But to reach, to reach there, we need to go beyond uh, individual initiatives and to build a system and to have these principles enshrined in our policies. Thank you. And with that, it's time to go to the floor to hear brief comments or questions to the panel at large or individual uh, panelists. So if you could give me your name, maybe we'll take a list of five names. Let me just do a, yeah, go ahead. And then we'll take okay. four, four more questions. Be sure to introduce yourself, please. Sure. My name is Mike Seto Usu, and I'm from the African Union Commission. Uh, we've had several presentations about uh, the limited capacity of renewable energy sources, like solar, which was mentioned. Uh, Africa is being encouraged to go for this option and to uh, turn away from options such as nuclear fission, which most developed countries have used to build their industries. And this is why we call them developed. Now, I feel that, that Africa is between a rock and a hard place because we are being told to give up this opportunity and we are being told to go for the option which has not been developed yet. So how are we going to see this and how are we going to make sure that we are taking the decision that has not put us on the uh, short change side? Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments, reactions to how to concretely advance on circular economy in Africa? Examples uh, across the continent that have worked, that we can build on, levers that we need to put in place to incentivize. Yes. Hello, Eliane Yubali Duro. Uh, I'm Rwandan, but I am a professor at McGill University in Canada. How do we um, make it mandatory in terms of Africa's development that everything be a circular economy in terms of uh, incentives for financing? Uh, given all the data we've looked at in the last days here and at the Gender Summit previously, there is no other way in terms of growing Africa and ensuring that our population um, has a healthy environment. So what, are, what can we do? I think the uh, agreement or the, or the uh, discussions between Nigeria, Rwanda and South Africa are a great example and it'd be great to hear <coughs> more about it and ensure that other countries um, are incentivized to join that. But concretely, uh, how do we ensure that the financial mechanisms that are going to grow Africa this century have that as a basic principle like um, Dr. Virita was talking about in terms of bringing it into uh, policy making in Rwanda. Good, good questions. I see a, a hand up right here. Uh, bonjour à tout le monde, c'est Fadel Kebe, je suis de, du Sénégal, je suis uh, à l'université et je suis responsable du centre d'incubation et de développement d'entreprises innovantes. Alors, je voudrais en fait intervenir sur uh, une des formes d'énergie renouvelable qu'on a une des formes d'énergie du moins conventionnelle qu'on a l'habitude d'oublier et qui par contre est la seule source d'énergie presque qu'on utilise en Afrique, c'est la biomasse. On parle beaucoup d'énergie, on parle d'énergie renouvelable, mais quand on questionne les systèmes d'information d'énergie dans nos pays, on se rend compte que 80% de l'énergie que nous consommons, c'est le bois. Et à ma grande bonne surprise, quand on discute sur des solutions, sur des transitions énergétiques, on saute cette énergie. 
et qui aujourd'hui, d'ici 20 ans, 30 ans, ce serait utopique de dire que cette énergie, on ne va pas l'utiliser. Je voulais en tout cas questionner ces panélistes pour dire pourquoi aujourd'hui cette forme d'énergie, qui est la seule finalement qu'on utilise, qui aujourd'hui a des problèmes extrêmement pressants, sur la déforestation, parce qu'aujourd'hui on voit les techniques utilisées qui sont déficience complètement mauvaise. On voit toute la possibilité de euh, pollution intérieure que cette technologie amène avec l'ensemble des morts que nous concevons dans nos cuisines rurales. Pourquoi aujourd'hui cette technologie elle est reléguée au second plan alors que c'est elle aujourd'hui qui fait tourner en dehors des grandes villes la population rurale. J'aimerais bien qu'on puisse réfléchir sur cette énergie et dire aujourd'hui qu'il faut qu enfin qu'on puisse résoudre cette, cette forme d'énergie et apporter des solutions. Ok de parler d'énergie renouvelable, mais moi aujourd'hui réglons le problème de cette énergie qui est là, qui est la seule énergie qu'aujourd'hui je dirais qu'on utilise en Afrique. Merci aux collègues du Sénégal pour cette question sur la biomasse et le lien avec les populations ruraux. Other reflections? Right here. And then after, either one, either order. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, my name is June. Um, I'm from Nigeria, but I'm currently researching in energy economics here in Kigali. Um, I would actually like um, Mr. Hans to answer in this area because you said debt makes the business interesting and for you to get the financing, you need to make it profitable and you need to also factor in debt. So I just want to know the key ingredients because one of the challenges I'm having with the research I'm currently doing is they keep saying the technology is expensive, but it is the most efficient in terms of getting the result, in terms of getting the amount of energy we need. So how do you get technology that is efficient and put it in context for Africa or whichever country within, within Africa, I am looking at Nigeria, and also get the money you need to get results? So what are the key ingredients and, and even the policy issues that we need to consider within the African context? Thank you. Thank you. Just pass the microphone down, uh, and then we'll come here. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Charles Kimpolo. Uh, I head the MC Industry Initiative. I haven't heard a lot of capacity building, and it's quite a concern. Um, you did not speak about it. So my question is, like, are you assuming that we have a skills in Africa to support the circular in, uh, um, economy? Um, so I will ask a question to a new fellow. Do you see a lot of people like you in Africa with your type of knowledge and technical knowledge in Africa to support this? If not, what should be our capacity uh, building strategy? Thanks for identifying the gaps in our discussion thus far. And then we are over to Tade here. And I see a woman here. And then we'll come back to the panel. My name is Tade Aino. I'm the executive director for the Partnership for African and Social and Governance Research based in Nairobi, Kenya. I want to ask the Honorable Minister and the UNESCO representative, I've heard quite a lot about markets. I've heard quite a lot about political will. I'm interested in the balance between advocacy and political will. And I'd like you to address this because if there's going to be a shift from evidence political action, I think there has to be some kind of dynamic push. And so I would like you to reflect a little bit on, the, on what kind of intersection we could have between both. Thank you. So the movement from evidence to policy. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Akoleta Ruhamia, Director General Rwanda Environment Management Authority. Um, I really appreciate the presenters or the panelists, but I just want to emphasize on to support researchers of Africa. This is because when we say we need right policies, <coughs> standards, and regulations, but this should be uh, 
research-based, that we have facts to support researchers or research uh, to support <coughs> policies, standards, and the regulations. But you find most of the time we just promote some technologies, but we don't really uh, research in Africa. We actually base on the findings done from outside. I think one of the pro uh, panelists, I don't remember the name, the name well, that he said in Germany there is uh, about 40,000 megawatts uh, from solar. But you find most of the time when you promote uh, use of solar in African countries, we rely the supplier from those countries. And yet we need to develop uh, from our own, or developed by our own researchers and engineers. So I think we really need to support our researchers to be able to develop the technology that is uh, acceptable to our people and you can actually create those jobs. Uh, one of the, I think the panelists again said we, sh we need to make the technology profitable. But making it profitable, we need to have the right technologies and get more people that can buy in and create that market. So we need to more uh, support our researchers in Africa to develop the appropriate technologies and support our people to create jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So we'll start, I think you, I trust you each heard the questions that were directed to you. Let's start with um, Justice and move this way. Uh, there's uh, someone who asked a question on nuclear energy and why Africa is not being given the opportunity to, to why is not, no one speaking about nuclear energy in Africa? I think it is better to be forward-looking than looking backward. Uh, as a scientist, I believe in the safety of nuclear energy. We have had some disasters here and there. By and large, if you are going to rely on uranium, I'm not for finite resources. I'm for resources which we can use inexhaustibly. And Africa itself is not technologically, I should say, young for nuclear technology for many reasons, and including security reasons. So it is something we have to put some, keep the house clean before we can begin to dream about this. And many countries are decommissioning nuclear energy power plants. So I think let's think before looking. But if you like, you can do research on nuclear fusion energy. And uh, this is also one dream. If we can crack through the nuclear fusion energy, we also get uh, inexhaustible energy, which we can uh, have for humanity. Uh, let me answer questions maybe which are more pertinent to me. Uh, someone asked a question on biomass, renewables. Why are we not speaking about biomass? Um, I don't know whether I got this question right, because you, you said we're not speaking about biomass, and you mentioned deforestation. Uh, now, let me speak about Africa, we know that in Africa we rely a lot on biomass. I think we have to worry a lot, actually. Uh, let me just make something personal here. When I was young, because I grew up deep in the rural areas, this was the primary fuel that we needed for everything. Now, in my lifespan, which I don't consider so long, I have seen devastating deforestation. I took it upon myself, I said, no, I'm going to be the example in my village. I'm going to have the <coughs> largest coverage of forestry to encourage people to grow forests. So, and right now, I think if I can leave any legacy in my village, it's about the person who has the largest forest cover is me with the biggest trees. Uh, so, but we face a real, real threat. When I scan through many families, I even cannot imagine where they get their fuel resource. So biomass, we are, even if each of us planted a tree today, I think the pressure we are exerting on biomass, we are consuming it exceedingly unsustainably. We must put a hold to this. So we can, it can be part of the mix in our energy, but then I think we have to really very quickly shift to technologies which are clean and we don't uh, deplete the forest resources. So we cannot eliminate it from the picture. It can be part of the mix, but we have to bear in mind that it's a finite resource and we are consuming it at unsustainable rates. Thank you. Moving on to your neighbor, Hans. Thank you. 
I was very intrigued by the first two questions, especially together, because if I rephrase it a little bit, <coughs> the gentleman on the left, uh, you said, uh, why should Africa go for all this new renewable stuff? We need for development energy now, and these Western countries, they got rich on, on normal energy sources, so why should we do it on renewable energy sources? Huh? I understand that question. I think it's a fair question. And then the other question was exactly the opposite. It was, we know we have to do better. We know we, we shouldn't make the same mistakes, so how can we enforce this? And both are equally true. It's not that uh, the one uh, is, is, is stronger than the other. We know we have to go in that direction, but we also know that Africa deserves a fair economic development. And energy is the basis for economic development. And there, there is this tension where we have to see how we can bridge that gap without damaging the earth too much. And I think uh, that it's uh, wise politics to look ahead. Not to look backwards, uh, like my colleague said, but to look ahead. So uh, renewable energy has options. There are, in many situations, good options, but not always. And I think uh, if you look at the total global emissions from Africa compared to the world, that if you need to run a city like uh, Lagos, or you need to build uh, huge car factories in, in Kenya, then you're not going to do that only with biomass or sun, you know, then you re need sometimes something else as well. So it's about smart combinations. Should we put a huge classic electrical grid all across Africa? No, that's very un, uh, inefficient and not future-proof. So we will have, for the sake of economic development, to accept at some point uh, that we are not completely future-proof yet. But we have in our politics to think ahead and indeed to enforce as much as possible to benefit uh, uh, the good business cases. And that brings me to the, uh, the question of, I think her name was June, on how can you, you force that, uh, that benefit. Well, governments have a lot of tools. When I was uh, a director in the ministry, I, I got a lot of tools to say uh, a company has to pay for this or gets tax cuts on this. Or, and if a company comes to an African country and wants to invest, you can ask, well, let's, I'm happy that anyone is investing and I don't put any rules. You can also say, what are you going to do with your waste? Uh, how do you think about producing your energy? Do you going to put solar on your, on your big roofs? You can ask these questions. And the more competitive your country is, the stronger you stand to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. Industry prefers to invest in a strong, well-organized country. So they, I don't think industry is against complicated regulations. They, they know how to handle that. They got it everywhere. So they are, uh, they are used to that. So be fierce to industry. Impose your standards and make a renewable business case, a profitable business case. Great, thank you so much. And as we turn to Rocio, sh share what you like, but also keep in mind what are the research questions that we should be working on to promote circular economy? So respond to that or whatever else is on your mind. Yeah, I, I would like to be a little bit provocative here and say low carbon technologies for energy are very important because of climate change, but also it's a slightly different to talk about circular economy, which I mentioned before. It's reuse, recycle, and uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle. So, for example, if we want to really get more into uh, the energy topic, well, it could be part of the research on how you produce the panels here, which type of materials are done it. So there are, they seem to be similar because they are in low carbon technology, but at the same time, they are different. And maybe in that case, I would also uh, like to respond to the question on, on research. Maybe if it is a different definition for Africa, that is also part of the, of the research. How you also adapt some of the methodologies that are there to the context of African countries. I think that there is a difference. Uh, the question about the, the issues on the, 
on the regulations and the standards. I agree there are incentives, but they have to be also studied on how they can be done for the African uh, context. And um, I think there is uh, enough research there to see which type of residues are there that can be used for the next uh, uh, link or block in another value chain that can bring it back uh, uh, and not dumped into the, into the environment. And the last question on, the, on biomass, I, it's not that we have forgotten it. Uh, I think that with biomass, we have to really look at these other ways to, to utilize it. I mentioned examples on, on for the production of pellets, so maybe be more efficient on, on how we use the, the woody biomass. Uh, it has created, I cannot deny it, some questioning in, uh, in Europe or in the United States, but maybe we can re review it in the context of the bioeconomy and the uh, circular economy for the case of, of Africa with different options that are not just the cooking stoves or the better production of, of uh, charcoal. Excellent. Juan Therese. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, I would uh, look at the two uh, questions that were raised, one on the issue of capacity. Um, uh, the lady out there, I think you're very right. <laughs> and most of the time when we talk about technology, we, we talk about um, you know, uh, implementation, we forget the fact that in Africa we are still dealing with a huge population, both at the, the, the level of young people and adults that are illiterate or are semi-literate. And therefore, there should be investment in education to build those knowledge bases that would ensure that we can really, um, you know, uh, there will be uptake of whatever innovation. So like, like has been mentioned this morning, we do not have the luxury to take on a rather linear approach. I believe what we need to look at is multiplicity of approaches that will gradually take us there. And therefore, yes, our universities must really focus on what type of a curriculum to respond to the needs of society. I started off by saying, in Africa, we have a huge need for energy. And yes, it's true, I had mentioned that one part of Sub-Saharan Africa focuses more on biomass. And it has its own uh, repercussion on our forest cover. How else can we really, through the circular eco economy, uh, improve that situation? Again, from the Sahel, uh, we do a lot of groundnut um, farming, etc. We also know that from the waste of the, the, the process of uh, you know, production of oil and soap, you can still also have what um, then uh, uh, most of the time is briquette. But you know, what we are doing most of the time in Africa is trying to imitate and copy without necessarily studying and uh, looking at the research and the evidence on the choices we make. So it comes back to how can governments in their policy decisions use evidence and then not just um, <coughs> introduce something today and leave it at will, but ensure there is follow-up, there is sustainable kind of engagement. And I would also uh, like to say, it is not just about the jobs, it's about the environment, it's about the health. And so in our negotiations, I'll come back to companies, let us really ensure we negotiate right and make the right types of conditions to, for a win-win, rather than one in which we're looking at the jobs that will be created in, uh, you know, um, as opposed to uh, looking at the gains, both in terms of the people, the people's health, and then the health of the environment. And UNESCO is doing a lot of that in our policy um, discussions and negotiations with government so that it's not always about money. It's also about the welfare, the well-being of the people and uh, the environment. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll hear from uh, the minister, and then we'll go back for just one sentence, one sentence from each panelist to, to wrap up. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, I say uh, a few words on uh, the policy-related questions. 
from advocacy and political will to uh, real things. I think the role of governments is to adopt policies, to put in place the legal and regulatory framework, and eventually build the capacities for the, the country to deliver. But the government can, should go beyond and put in place the incentives which are needed for the change it wants. So uh, we should consider circular economy just not as a new policy or new principles we have to adopt. It, it constitutes business opportunities. It is about profit. It is about uh, wealth creation. Uh, and the government needs to put in place the policies, the legal and the regulatory framework, but also think about the incentives which will be needed for the change uh, we want. Uh, to make mandatory these principles uh, in our economies, there are many ways. There are many ways. You can put in place the laws, you can uh, have the regulations, but it is, it is crucial that we have also the mechanisms to incentivize people to change. I can give an example. Here uh, in Rwanda, we have our Green Fund. It is uh, named for Nirwa. It is the one which financed our electronic waste plant, the first one, with a capacity of 10,000 tons of waste uh, to be treated by year. And that very green fund has an innovation window to support, uh, to support the creation of new technologies as reflected by the Director General of Rwanda Environment Management Authority. So all these are laws and uh, regulation will not be enough. We need also to put in place this mechanism which you will be able to accompany uh, these laws and uh, these principles we want uh, the country to, to adopt. Uh, I liked the comment made by, by Hans on uh, I don't remember very well, but it was, uh, it, was it on, on pellet eventually? So. Sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, the, you made a very good comment uh, on one question which was raised on um, biomass, I think. There are many things we can do. Biomass, firewood and charcoal are causing deforestation. Uh, the use of uh, these uh, sources of, for sources, sources of energy are causing deforestation, they are causing indoor pollution, but there are many levels where we can act. First of all, we can act on the way we are producing the charcoal, the techniques we are using. Eventually in Africa we are using uh, firewood which is not dry enough and which is causing uh, pollution, indoor pollution. We can act on the cook stoves we are using. The, 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 the efficiency of these cook stoves is also uh, a level on which we can act. And uh, of course, the sustainable solution will be to shift from biomass to uh, sustainable sources of energy. But while we, we are not there yet, we can improve on these uh, various aspects and make sure we are not, we are protecting our forest and we are also protecting our people from uh, air pollution. And your final Thank word, you. Minister, is the final message for this panel? Final message is that uh, circular economy, as I uh, stated uh, when we started this discussion, it can be considered as a new concept, emerging concept, but the practice has been there all the time. What we need to do is to understand that we cannot uh, continue to, to do business as usual. We have to adopt the, the, the secular economy uh, principles to make sure we shift from the linear model of economy where we take, we make, and we just waste to the landfill, but we reuse, we reduce, and we recycle. And we need to consider that as a business opportunity, not just as the new policies which are going to, to cost us a lot. It is uh, business opportunities, 
and uh, research and science are there to help us to, to, to produce new, not only new products, but also uh, to design new products and to design new materials which are renewable, recyclable, and biodegradable. I thank you. Dear panelists, I think that since we have time out flashing at us, that uh, we will accept uh, the minister's final words on behalf of the entire panel. I would like to very much thank each of the panelists. We uh, met this morning over breakfast, had a very animated discussion. They put their, uh, their selves into this panel. Thanks for sharing your ideas, your perspectives. And I know that going forward with e circular economies depends on us here at uh, NEF to be curious, to ask the right questions, to conduct the research that's needed and to create the success stories that we need on the continent related to circular economies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Touré and the panelists for such a wonderful session. I would like to draw your attention on the following item. You may have received this flyer this flyer is for a science theater play inspired by Richard Feynman. The play will take place twice throughout the, the gathering today at 8.15, 6, 6 p.m. It will be in room MH1 and tomorrow, Wednesday, at 5 p.m. in the same room MH1. Donc, je voudrais tirer votre attention sur la pièce théâtrale au